Hi there guys, it's Mike from MCQ Bushcraft here and welcome to another video. And in this video we're going to be on the coastline and we're primarily going to be looking at different types of shellfish that you can find on the coastline, gather very easily and cook very easily. I've shown videos in the past of my preferred methods of catching suitable or substantial amounts of food on the coastline and that's really through long lining or trot lining where you can catch quite a lot of fish depending on how much work you wish to put in. But that kind of method requires equipment and you may not always have that kind of equipment to hand or be able to make it because it's generally required in quite a lot of quantity to be successful. And this is where gathering shellfish can be very easy and uh, requires very few calories to actually collect and burn them provided you've got the ability to make a fire. So let's get going and head over to the rocks over there and actually have a look and see what we can find. you're going to be able to find uh, shellfish basically when the tide goes out a lot of these shellfish are left retaining the water and sitting there waiting for the tide to come back in and uh, obviously the tide's lapping behind me there so we're going to have to move quickly we'll have a look around this area gather some and then make our way back inland a little bit make a fire and cook some up you can probably see just down on these rocks here that we've got a lot of little sea snails and these are periwinkles and there are different variations of periwinkles they come in all shapes and sizes they vary across the world and uh, these ones are particularly small but are very good edible they just need to be gathered in quantity because obviously they provide you with very few calories but if you are on the coastline you're looking for something to eat these just need to be picked just like this and put in boiling water for between three to ten minutes it really depends on what your suspects are the quality of the water around you and they can just be boiled and picked out with a needle or a piece of wood that you sharpen into a toothpick and eaten and they're actually very nice they're actually quite good to eat very popular on the continent these are quite small but uh, we're going to gather them in quantity which is really the key taking me no time at all really just to gather a little handful there you know, sort of 10 seconds or so so just spending a bit of time grazing on the coastline like this and being patient which is really what foraging is it's a very patient low calorific way of, of finding food I just carry a small satchel on my belt and the periwinkles and whatever I forage can just be put in and it can hold quite a lot we'll keep foraging Obviously we need a lot more really if we're going to have a meal. So on this big rock here we can see some shellfish. Here, here. In fact they're decorating the rock everywhere. There's obviously a lot more than just the ones we see, much smaller ones too. But this here is called a limpet. And a limpet is a type of shellfish that's pretty much abundant on most coastlines all over the world in various shapes and forms. And it's a particularly safe one that you can actually forage very easily. I say safe because of the nature of the way the limpet actually operates. It clamps itself to this rock. When the tide comes in and the water will be up here somewhere, the limpet will just make its way around the rock and eat algae and various other decaying matter that it will find and then it will return to a, a nice location and clamp itself back retain some water within it ready for the tide to go out again and you can actually see flat spots on this rock where limpets have actually been and you can see that they've moved around and they're obviously doing quite well on this rock you have other types of shellfish like mussels and mussels are bivalves which means they filter feed and various types of shellfish will filter feed and they require more caution which makes them a little bit um, 
different really in, in some respects. It means that you need really local knowledge of the waters around you and you need to be familiar with the area. If the area has a lot of toxicity in the water, human faeces, an outlet pipe for example, or you have uh, marine algae blooms that may be harmful to human health, then you really don't want to be eating mussels on a regular basis. We want to obtain a lot of knowledge about the area from the locals first. Um, and, and the reason being is it can be very harmful to human health because the mussel is effectively a filter and you're eating that filter. So not, not only are you eating what the mussel wants to eat, but the byproduct of that is the toxicity in the water can be retained within the mussel as well. And that goes for mussels on the estuary too, fresh water mussels. So the limpet doesn't operate that way, it eats what it wants and it forages around, it doesn't retain toxicity in the same way as the mussel. And that's not to say that all mussels are bad like that, I've eaten wild mussels for years off various coastlines, you just need knowledge of the waters around that surround the mussel. But to gather the limpets very easily. If we try and take this limpet here, what will happen is, is it will suddenly clamp itself to the rock and I cannot move that. There was some movement in it before, but now there's none because it has fused itself to the rock and detected danger. If I try and get this off now, the limpet will actually damage itself, the foot of the limpet that sucks itself onto the rock. It will get damaged by me taking it off and I can even crack the shell. You really need to tackle them when they don't know you're coming. If we take a blunt object like this stone here, we can actually dislodge this limpet very easily without it suspecting that we're coming. Just like that. And the limpet comes off very easy. You can see the water running out of it that it's retained. And there's the foot there, the muscular foot which we're going to eat. So I'm going to put this in my pack and we're going to gather some more. One thing I will advise is don't clean up off rocks of limpets. So you don't see me grabbing the rock and clearing every limpet I can see off of this one big boulder here. Because what I'll do is I'll just end up wiping out a generation of limpets that have probably lived here for a very, very long time. And there'll be a mixture of male and female on this rock. And even though limpets can actually change sex, so when they need to, they can change sex. If there's very few males, for example, on this rock, you know, the, the, the ecosystem can balance itself out. But you don't really want to damage that. And there are so many on different rocks around here. I can see them everywhere. There's no need for me to just clear this one and leave. You really want to preserve the species in a respect, and, but, but at the same time, if it's a food source you rely on, you, you want to harvest that crop the right way, like you would vegetables you'd plant in your garden. So just take a few off of this rock, and not just the biggest, just stagger your selection and put them in your pouch and make your way around. And although we are against the tide today, that's just the way it is. I should have got up earlier. But let's see whether we can find some more. So I think that's enough really from this location. I don't want to gather too many because I'm mindful that this is really just a demonstration. But the amount I've gathered is nowhere near enough that you would require to actually sustain yourself. You would need quite a lot. They're very low in calories, limpets. They're mainly just a bit of protein and simple carbohydrate. So, uh, and, and very low. In, in, all honesty and it's quite a small bit of food. I tend to mix these with mussels and rice and uh, make like a sort of shellfish type food that I can eat when I'm out backpacking and doing things like that on the coastline. But there is another type of shellfish that is abundant, more so than the limpet, all over these rocks. You've probably seen them off footage really and that's the mussel but a certain bit of caution or precaution comes with the mussel and we'll go and have a look at them and talk about it and I need to get higher up because the water is almost reaching me. There we go. Lots of mussels. Not the biggest I've seen but a good selection. You can see a lot of them are banded together in big bunches and they're everywhere on this coastline. Foraging the mussel is very simple. It's not like the limpet where you have to creep up on it and whack it off of the rock. It's a little bit like the periwinkle and various other shellfish. It can just be picked like this and there's one there. 
and uh, this one's sealed up quite nicely, retaining water like they do, like a lot of shellfish will do as the tide goes out. But again, they operate differently like we talked about when we first had a look at the limpet. These are filters, this is effectively a big wall of filters. And they suck the water in and pump it out and from that they gather the nutrition that they want by taking in the water. The downside of that is that if there's toxicity in the water, then they can take that in also and retain it. And if they're not cleared out with clean water over a period of time and you eat them, you will obviously ingest that toxicity. You may say to yourself, well, boiling is the key then, or, or cooking thoroughly. It is, and it, unfortunately cooking them thoroughly does ruin them, actually. It does ruin the flavour, but cooking them thoroughly will kill a lot of the bacteria and toxicity that's actually in the mussel if you want to eat it. But there is a downside to that, and that's certain types of marine algae that can be harmful to human health. If you ever heard of a red tide, which is the, the term for it, a red tide is just sort of like a nickname, but what it refers to is algae blooms that can happen in various parts of the world. It can happen here, it can happen in a lot of parts of the world, really. And it's blooms of algae, and it can actually turn the tide a tinge of red, which is why they, they say red tide. It doesn't always do that, of course, and uh, really depends on where you are in the world and the clarity of the water. But marine algae, there's, there's obviously many, many different types, but there are certain types of marine algae that can be harmful to human health. And it's not the algae itself, so obviously boiling or cooking the mussel will kill, will neutralise the algae. But what it won't do is uh, remove the toxin that the algae actually produces, that that's the thing that's harmful to human health. It's not the algae, it's, it's the toxicity that the algae produces, and that cannot be neutralised through boiling, or just through boiling. Um, really mussels like this and a lot of wild mussels, they'll be picked and they'll be cleaned out in various areas. Um, they'll, be, they'll be put into big vats and they're filtered through and they're cleaned out just like any other filter would be. And uh, if you don't have the ability to do that in the wild then it's best to leave them alone and go for other things because you can get very ill and, and it's not just a case of you'll get the runs, you'll have diarrhea and you'll go home and you know you'll remember that. It can actually kill you. The toxicity in certain types of marine algae can kill you. It can cause neurological damage, it can cause lots of different types of damage to the human body. I, I know someone personally who's had that experience from eating shellfish and been poisoned by marine algae and he can't touch fish ever again. He smells it and, and he, feels, he feels odd, he eats it and he's violently ill. You know, and then that, that was maybe 10, 15 years ago. He's quite an old boy now, so it was, it was some time ago. But it's really altered his body and his body certainly remembers it and it's changed him. So there, there are certain cautions of picking mussels. I'm not particularly confident on, on the waters in this area. I've seen ships dumping things, and I've seen foam and other bizarre things wash up, you know, all across the coastline, big bubbles and dirty water and, and pollution, and, and it's just something that saddens me greatly. But you see them doing it out there every now and then, and there's nothing I can do about it here. So uh, you just have to be careful. But I've eaten mussels here before and they are delicious, they're actually one of my favourite. It just requires some caution and just some local knowledge of the waters that surround them. So if you do wish to forage them, I will go for it. But really in this video I'm just showing you the safer ones which you can eat, which are limpets, periwinkles, things that you can find and just pick and not worry about at all. But I think we should head inland now, make a fire and actually cook up. Um, our catch of the day. Not that we've really had to catch it at all, but let's get moving because the tide is really coming in now. This is a good edible plant, actually one of my favourite by the coastline. This is Alexander's, very peppery taste. Mm. These are all quite young shoots you see. Very early member of the Umbelliferae family, Rapiaceae family, 
comes out very early spring, so one of the first ones really to come and go. But very nice, quite peppery, I prefer it with wood pigeon, but anything to make the flavour of limpets better is welcome. So I'll gather just a little bit of this, put in the pan with it. So I've left my kit, I've hanged the shellfish in a tree and uh, just put all my gear out there because uh, this is a very difficult environment to navigate through when you've got things on your back and you're carrying a lot of stuff because there's brambles everywhere and they're literally like trip wires covered in razor blades and they'll chop you up pretty good if you don't take your time. But the reason I've come into the middle of this overgrown sort of dwarven woodland here by the coast is because this is the only place for miles that silver birch grows and you can see silver birch growing around me. A large one behind me there, I say large, it's large for this area, but most of them are quite young and uh, they're shedding naturally, which is very good. I'm not just going to take my knife and strip the bark off of them because it can kill them and I'll just be taking more than I need, but I just need to spend some time taking off the naturally shedding bark that they've got all over them and I have enough material then to actually get a fire going. So I've laid a raft down, predominantly of hardwood, ash, which grows are in and around this area. And there's quite a lot of dead ash on the floor, lots of deadfalls, so it's perfect really. And there are actually coastal conifers growing around here as well, and a lot of the dry twigs suspended in the trees I've taken, and I've got lots of dry material there full of resin, which will help me get the fire going. So we've got all the materials we need, I've got my tinder, and we're going to need to burn this fire through, and hopefully let that bed turn into embers, and then we can start cooking. But if we're actually going to boil, then flame is really all we need. But if you're going to cook on a fire without a container, then you need to let that fire burn down. You don't want it hot. You want it really just to cook things a bit slower. But let's get the fire going. just let that develop. I don't want the wind to damage it yet. It can be very fragile when it's first going. But then we can just put that in the fire now. There we go. I'm going to lift that away a little bit, let that oxygen get in, we don't really want to smother things. When people make fires, I often see them put on one twig at a time. You waste your ignition material, your tinder, if you do that. You really want to get a lot of material on it, encompass it, use that heat, but don't smother it. So oxygen needs to come in, but you, you want to be using all that heat efficiently, or else it's just going to nothing. fire's going nicely. I'm just going to wait for more wood to burn down for it to just get a bit more manageable. And the first thing we're going to do is cook our periwinkles. Really easy to cook and uh, you just need, really need to put them into a canteen like this one. Make sure the water's very very hot, basically boiling, and just pop them in. You can steam them as well, but it's just a real sound way of cooking them boiling. Very simple, easy to do. So we'll wait for this fire to die down a bit and then we'll do that. I 
I put a little bit of Alexander's in just to flavour the water because afterwards you end up with a stock that you can actually drink. But what you do now, put the periwinkles in and we'll put it back on for maybe five minutes. So they're cooking away there for five minutes and it's a really simple way of cooking them. Getting them out of the shell requires a little bit of technique but nothing too special. But what we can actually do is do exactly the same thing with our limpets, just boil them. And while these are boiling, I'll add a couple in and you can see what happens when they are cooked because what they'll do is they'll just separate from the shell and it's a very simple way of cooking them. So these are almost certainly done now, they've been in there for about five minutes. It's probably going to be quite hot, but we'll take that out. So because we want the stock, I'm going to have to fish them out with my sport. And you can see that the limpet shells are actually empty. There's, uh, there's nothing in them and that's obviously a sure sign that they're cooked. I can assure you, because of the size of these limpets, you'll be disappointed at how much meat's actually there. Not much at all, which is why this beach isn't particularly the best for this kind of foraging. Um, there's a very poor low tide point for rocks. If there are rocks really far out where the low tide point would be, you'd find that the shellfish would be much bigger, especially the mussels. You can see one of the limpets just there. Tiny little piece of meat, which is why you really want to combine it with other foods. We'll get the rest of these winkles out. So we've got our plate of food here. A couple of limpets just to demonstrate what they're like when they're boiled. And obviously our winkles here as well. But to get the winkles out of the shell, you're going to need a specific piece of equipment. Now if you carry a sewing kit, you'll have a needle on you, like this one here. I carry a sewing kit and my med kit. I have a few needles. And needle is a very good bit of kit, really, to get the winkle out of its shell. The limpets, they've detached from the shell as they do when they're cooked. It's a good indicator. But there's a little bit we need to do with them, really, first. But it's a fiddly job, so I'm afraid gloves are going to have to come off. The limpet is just here that pathetic little morsel there, but then these are really small and they do reduce when being cooked in that manner. You can see on the top of it, you have the gut sack. That can be picked off like this and removed. Some people like to eat the gut sack, they say it gives it flavor. Personally, I would disagree and say not to eat it, but that's the little morsel right there. Limpets are pretty good if you put some salt on them, or even if you have them with balsamic vinegar, they're quite nice, but on their own, a little bit rubbery. Good flavour, but rubbery. And if you boil them for too long, or even cook them for too long, they get even, even more rubbery, basically. But they're not too bad. And it's food at the end of the day. The shells make great bearing blocks for friction fire kits or bow drill kits. They don't even need to be mounted in wood when they have barnacles on. If you have a thick glove that can bear the heat, then the barnacles grip into the glove and you know, it's just a bearing block in itself. But the winkles require some technique to get out of the shell. If we take our needle and we take one of the winkles, all that's really needed is to pull it out like that. And that's the winkle. I actually almost prefer them to limpets in a respect. They're easier to gather. There's more of them. They're easier to eat and they're tastier. They are much tastier and less rubbery as well. But you can eat the whole thing just like this. And it's really the slow task of picking them out the shell and sitting here and eating. And that's really what people would have done years ago. I think eating would have dominated quite a large portion of their time. 
it's a pretty quick job in today's day and age but it's certainly not a quick job when you're actually out here trying to find food the stock itself should be pretty good yeah that's all right actually that has quite a lot of flavor to it a little bit salty you've got some peppery taste in it it's nice Mm. On a cold day, that would be really good. Almost tastes like it would uh, ease a sore throat really nicely. It's quite smooth. <sighs> mm. That's pretty good. But the fire's dying down now. Let's have a look at these limpets. So I've put these limpets on a rock. This rock's pretty dry actually, which is important. You don't want to be putting wet rocks in the fire because they can blow up. And this will go in the fire at some point. But most of these limpets are starting to clamp down. Some haven't clamped down properly yet. They're still not too sure about what they're doing, given the trauma they've suffered. But they will eventually clamp down onto that rock. They don't necessarily need to for this next process, but We've seen how they act when you boil them, very simple. Winkles are really better boiled, to be quite honest with you, or steamed. But these can be cooked in a variety of ways. Now, if you don't have a container, this is quite a good way of cooking them. You can get a rock, put it near a fire, brush the embers, not the flames, but the embers of a fire over the top, and just leave it for a few minutes, and they will begin to cook. And when they're cooked, you can pick the shells off and you'll see the meat underneath all over the place and it's like a, a dinner plate of food. It's a nice way of doing it. But if you don't have anything at all, you don't even have rocks, which is quite um, hard to believe on the coastline, you can just take the limpet like this and place them in the fire upside down so they cook in the shell. We can get the embers of the fire. We don't want them to be red hot, these embers. They can be quite cool actually. I mean, that there is fine. We just need to make sure it's away from the rest of the heat or else that will affect it but that there's okay that little area and we can just place the limpets on just like this and they will start to cook in the shells and they only need a few minutes when they separate themselves from the shells like this and they are done. You can see them rattling around in the shell. They only really take a few minutes. Again, the same techniques apply. You pop it out of the shell. You can take the black bubble off or choose to eat it. And there you have your, your limpet. Mmm. Tastes a lot better than it does when you boil it. A little bit saltier, which is nice. Still chewy. That's just limpets. So some of these have clamped down on the rocks now, but we'll just group the ones in that haven't. We're going to put this stone near the fire, brush all the coals on top, and then leave it for a few minutes. And then the shells should just pick right off. There we go, there's our big rock. You can fry on rocks, I've done it before. Cooked pieces of meat on rocks and uh, you just need a little bit of fat and basically you've got a frying pan. But the thing to remember is you have to sterilize the rock first. We don't necessarily need to do that in this case. Here's our limpet. Try not to lose any. This is the thing about this method is that 
when you're brushing off the ashes. You just need to take your time. The shells should lift away and there's the meat underneath and you can do that with almost all of them. This one's stuck to the shell. That doesn't mean it's not cooked, it just means that it's actually burnt slightly on top where the gut sac has banged to the shell. But most of them will lift off quite nicely, I'd imagine. There we go. There's another. So there we are, there's our, our limpets. You can see the way they cook there. That bubble on the top is the gut sac like we talked about. But we can pick some of these now and just try them and see what they're like. That one there looks pretty good. Just take off the black bubble at the top. Mm. Yeah, that's um that's pretty good actually. Very similar to when we just put them on the fire in their shell upside down same sort of method except the rock obviously heats up a bit but not enough to actually be a frying pan it would need to be on the fire for some time mm. so I hope you enjoyed that video guys just a simple video covering limpets and periwinkles and they can be found in abundance and cooked very easily without containers or with containers it really depends on which method you choose the flavors are often better without containers if you avoid boiling because you get that bit of salt and it really just does improve the flavour for you. But there are many other shellfish out there, things like mussels, razor clams, even crabs. There are in abundance on this coastline here and in future videos we'll have a look at other different shellfish out there and ways of cooking them with and without containers if you're out in the wilderness and you want to use them as a food source. But do bear in mind you need a lot of them if they're going to sustain you. You really do need a lot of them. But if you bring supplies with you like rice and oats or even polenta, things that can be made into soups and stews and risottos, you can add these sorts of things to them, get that protein or that calorific intake from them and actually benefit from a bit more nutrition, capitalising on your environment. Thanks again for watching guys and I'll see you very soon in another video. Take care.